John chapter 4 is the account of Jesus uh, at the well. Jesus going through Samaria and interacting with this woman at the well in midday. Now, I, I love this account for a multitude of reasons. Number one, I love the fact that Jesus is actually going with his disciples through Samaria. I mean, Samaria was a region that a kosher Jew would never go through. Samaritans and Jews hated each other. And this goes back hundreds of years before this account in John chapter 4. But here is Jesus refusing allow, to allow the barriers that we have created in the own division and disunity and the hatred that we have between each other to dictate his kingdom. And so there he is, a Jewish Messiah going through Samaria. And as he comes there, I love the fact that he is interacting with a woman that was also considered taboo, especially the fact, verse 6, at around noon. You see, if a woman is out at a well at around the time of noon, this woman is probably scandalous. At the very least, the woman is an outsider. She is an outcast. Why? Because in the hot Mediter in the hot Middle Eastern sun, <laughs> women didn't go to the well at noon to draw water. No. They went before it got hot. They went early morning. And that's usually also the time whenever they would get together. And some of the gossip mills would begin to occur whenever all the women got together. And yet, for some reason, this woman is there at noon in the hot, sweltering sun, gathering water. Which indicates, on some level, she doesn't belong. She is an outcast. Especially for a Jewish messiah. And yet here is Jesus in verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples, you see, had gone into the town to buy food. I bet you their interaction was a bit awkward. A group of 12 Jews going into a Samaritan city to get food for their Jewish Messiah. And the Samaritan woman said, um, excuse me, <laughs> verse 9, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then John tells us, because... Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Then Jesus says this. He's, he's trying to hint. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Here's the question I'm going to be asking throughout this text for this week. The question is this. How often do we make a mistake of having God stare at us in the face and us miss the opportunity to ask him what only he can provide for us. Like, how often do we make that mistake that we simply make the mistake of what is staring at us in the face as a divine moment where God is trying to provide for us, and yet we get distracted or in some sense even misdiagnose the entire situation as a whole? That we miss God completely. She says in verse 11, Sir... Um, you don't have anything to draw with and this well is kind of deep. <laughs> so where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well itself and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Do you outdo them? Jesus says, well, well here's the issue. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. It reminds me of, the, of Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus is interacting with Satan and he mentions, hey, listen, man can't live off of bread alone, but they must feast off of every word of God. You see, there's a, there, there is a part of this that the very base needs that we have, that our body demands, in some sense has deceived us into thinking that what we need most is what the temporal world or what creation itself can provide for us. When in reality, what our thirst and what our hunger is a manifestation of is the desire and the thirst and the longing for God, for the infinite, for something that physical food could never satisfy. He says, you don't understand. What you, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Um, this is one of the reasons why miracles don't really enamor me much. Yeah, sure, cool. I mean, the guy, you healed his leg and it was broken. That's amazing. He could still break it again. It's kind of like when Jesus, you know, raised Lazarus from the dead. That's awesome. I mean, Lazarus still will die again. So cool. But 
I'm looking for something that lasts longer. <laughs> I'm looking for something that has eternal endurance. I mean, whoever drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but the water that I give, they will never thirst. The water I give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And then the woman says this, Sir, give me this water so that I won't go thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Here's the thing that's fascinating to me. The living water is speaking directly to her and all she asks is for a common drink. How often do we come to the word of God? How often do we stare the face into the face of the Holy Spirit? How often do we come to God and ask him for manna whenever he wants to give us a loaf of the bread of life? How often do we settle for the things around us to satisfy us when in reality all they are doing is reflecting the longing that God himself can, can that only God himself can satisfy? She's looking for another, a drink of water that will never make her physically thirsty again. But she has misdiagnosed her need. You know, oftentimes we do this with the things that surrounds us. And typically it's because we're hiding from our wounds. Oftentimes we look around and we think, if I just had this, or if I just was able to have that, or, or maybe if I had a new job, or maybe if, if my, my boss would listen to me, or, or if maybe my kids would no longer bother me, or maybe if my husband would just change, or my wife would just get it together, or... All we are doing is allowing the thirst in us to be tempted to be satisfied by an actual glass of water. When in reality, what it is we're being invited to, invited to is to ingest Christ himself. To take a drink of the well of the living water that will cause us to not just never thirst, but to actually even look at the definition of thirst differently. <laughs> it's interesting because my, uh, she, Jesus, in answering her question of where is this living water, Jesus says this, go call your husband and come back. I was talking to my older brother, Justin, not too long ago, and he made this observation about this text. He said, you know, I think it's interesting, first of all, that we forget that Jesus is actually answering her request for living water. But what is it that Jesus points out? What Jesus basically says is this, if you want living water, then pull out all of your junk, all of your wounds, all of the things you are hiding, and bring them into the light. This is the path to wholeness. This is the path to transformation, to restoration. This is the reason why I tell all of my students, everyone needs counseling. Everyone. I've been to counseling. My wife's been to counseling. We've been to counseling as couples. We've been to counseling as individuals. Why? Everyone needs safe places and trained professionals where we can take out all of our junk and have the Lord redeem us. You don't redeem you don't become restored. The spirit can't ultimately shine the light in the very recesses of your heart that you keep hidden because they are the wounds that you are trying to hide. And when Jesus brings her baggage into full light, the wounds are exposed so that the living water can actually clean them and heal them. I have no husband. You're right, he says, you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What, are, what you have just said is quite true. In other words, it's this. You've been an outcast for quite some time. But if you truly want to belong, then stop longing for water that can merely get you to the next drink. But instead, drink deep of Jesus, the living water, the one that will, will not just quench our thirst, but lead us to eternal life. Love you guys. Have a good week.